I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hello, everyone, from Hi. a different location here in a mindscape. Ooh. Actually, it's Linda's parents' yes. house. Yes. But it could it's be not a mindscape. Actually a mindscape. You never know. Yes. Uh, we do not have doors behind us. Uh, I know there's been a bit of a meme of there's always two doors behind you, but not today, folks. Not today. The doors are over there. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about, uh, the episode title is Mindscapes and Metaphors, because really, um, there's a lot of things in tabletop RPGs and in fantasy stories in general that, um, serve a role as metaphors for the kinds of challenges that people face in real life, whether they are external challenges or internal ones. Um, and that's all the more true with Mindscapes, where things that are usually, intangible and complex and ideological take on a physical form whether that is that you can interact with whether that is as manifestations or creatures that may have some kind of a will or whether that is as some kind of an effect that you can manipulate making the, some of these things that are usually more abstract into things that have mechanics to them absolutely one of the powers of like a fantasy game or a television show or a book series is to transform, you know, a real world fear, anxiety or challenge into some kind of a monster that you can then fight when often you cannot fight it, mm -hmm. the actual like source material. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look through bestiaries, a lot of the monsters that you see are monsters that are based upon monsters that come from a variety of real world cultures that were based upon legends that were based upon the idea of taking these sorts of lessons and stories and experiences and giving and them even if form. they're not from legends they yeah. can be based uh like the from myth they can still be based on popular fears like how the fear of diseases becomes like the like zombie curse and like the curse of the were creature or how the fear of, like, abductions becomes not only, obviously, gray aliens, but even Darrow abductions and Pathfinder and other things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the ideological connections of a lot of categories of creatures, like fiends have a lot of making those kinds of concepts of things like sin or means of dying or, like, things that people fear into, like, and this is the creature that represents. Exactly. Um, so when you're thinking about what you're going to put into a mindscape, those kinds of creatures that are more idea focused or connected in that way in nature make a very natural jump to being something that represents a concept. Metaphysical or metaphorical. Uh, another power that you gain from mindscapes in fantasy settings and why they are common enough uh, trope that that people have to delve into somebody's mindscape or their dreams or like their inner self is because it represents an unparalleled opportunity to give some characterization of a particular character that might be more nuanced than you can give by just having them say certain lines or take certain actions especially if they speak or act in a way that uh, differs from some of like their inner longings, desires, or motivations, you can experience like the gap between those two if you're able to see more of their inner workings as represented in a mindscape that may have like multiple avatars of different parts of themselves. If you like think like Inside Out or any other mm -hmm. of of your favorite movie or TV show or um or game that has delved into somebody's psyche so it can be you know different aspects of their personality that are represented as different creatures it can be different different thoughts or fears or aspirations that might be represented in different areas of the mindscape like you have different rooms of the mindscape that that represent different challenges that they're seeking to overcome mindscapes can also be ways to interact with information factual information about a character that you would have no way of otherwise figuring out like you know seeing scenes from their memories or you know interacting with a younger version of them or something like that to to get another view on the character um and when you're doing the mindscape adventures there's also like the the implication that it it has stakes for the mind of whoever's for the mind of whoever's mindscape that you're in 
that you're that you're messing around in there you know it could be something that ultimately is is helpful for them and it's like okay yeah you know this person has asked you to go on an adventure into their mindscape to assist them with like some kind of a monster that's that's been possessing them or causing some other issue or it could be you know that you're that it's a different situation where it's you know the you know something you know maybe the the with the possession idea maybe it's like you know this a villain that's gone in and caused these problems you, you have, have to, to go in and chase them. after them and then there's the question of like well you know how much do you what do you do while you're in there you know and then what how does that impact sort of the the free will or the autonomy of the person whose mind you're in and can they communicate with you and are like the versions of them you talk to while you're in there like the same as them you know and you get into the whole things like okay well this is one of their trains of thought but to what extent does that train of thought represent how they are that's right or you could go into their mind of someone who has an abandonment issues and impersonate their deity and tell them that they're special and have a important mission that uh, that matters yes uh, in a way that that helps to sort of like make them feel good about themselves and um, deals with the current problem by papering it over with a large amount of deception. Yes, I had a character who decided to do that once. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it, it has all sorts of like interesting moral and philosophical dilemmas, particularly if the character's like, oh, what, what, I'm in a mindscape now? Like, now what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. um you know fighter bumbling around in a mindscape and mindscapes too have a lot of potential for uh some of the same kinds of things you'll see in in planar adventures where the fundamental physical properties don't work in the same way and the the ways that they don't work as normal are a lot more impactful when they represent something you know if you if you have an area where you know the there's a lot of gaps between areas in the ground and you have unstable footing and that's representing you know some some uncertainty within their mind or like you know you have areas where you move more slowly because you feel like you're being weighted down in this section or you or know, the, the colors all drained away the colors all drained away or there are gaps in the mindscape because of the fact that someone's memories are fading mm -hmm. of of that particular region of and their you have brain. to like try to try to like recover memories from other places and fit things back together they're a good place for like puzzles too 100 percent. there's so many ways that that a mindscape based session can be different than a normal session it can also be kind of similar because you can have monsters that represent all sorts of problems a person has think like the game figment where like the different fears of each different uh type of thing that this person is dealing with are the monsters and the bosses of the areas that are around you but you can also have a session that's much more metaphorical where you don't face direct combat so much as victory points subsystems or clocks if you're playing in a different game that has clocks mm -hmm. And, like, weird abstract puzzles where you have to, like, utilize um, ideas of concepts as and make them into a physical in order to uh, do things and engage with the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And come up with out-of-the-box solutions to escape from, like, bizarre dreamlike dilemmas. Yeah. And when you're in a mindscape, too, it's important to have a sense, as the GM, even if it's not immediately clear to the players what this is, but what are the what are the stakes of it you know if you are knocked out in the mindscape do you wake up back in the real world are you trapped inside of the mindscape are you like you know are you gonna be you, you know you're ejected and you could just go back in or you're ejected and there's no way you can go back in or like you know is there something that might mess around with your physical bodies while you're in there that sort or of, is what your is mind going, what's vulnerable in the mind your mind was vulnerable in the mind so you could your die body. of fear in yes. the mindscape potentially from a phantasmal killer that mm -hmm. stops your heart with a heart attack from fear but like a finger of death would maybe wouldn't kill yeah. you because you're not really so are there certain things that aren't going to work on you and then are there other things that are going to be are there other things that are going to be more dangerous so there's certain powers that the pcs have that might be impeded or um enhanced exactly so you need to and you probably should let them know unless they're like the fighter in the mindscape who has no idea how they got there mm -hmm. their character probably is skilled enough to understand the stakes and be like look yeah if you die in the mindscape you don't die in real life mm -hmm. uh unless it was a mental kill spell like phantasmal killer because just your mental projection is dead and that means you wake up 
maybe you're in, in a coma for a while until you recover hit points, but it was like taking non-lethal mental damage. So that's a that's a good example of um, one way you could have it. You could just be like, no, yeah, like we're entering it in in the flesh, and our body has even entered into their mm -hmm. mind. It doesn't exist in the physical world right now, and if we get killed off in here. Or like our arm changes into a giraffe's head because it's in a weird mindscape. That will also be reflected, also reflected when we leave the mindscape. Also reflected our arm is still going to be a giraffe, yeah. The giraffe starts munching leaves mm -hmm. while you're trying to hold a sword. Yeah, you know, what can you take out of the mindscape when you leave? Are there going to be, is there a potential that you're going to have some kind of like very strange like persona monster style creature that's going to follow you out of the mindscape or like items that you get in the mindscape? And then also like... How does that interact with the equipment that you have in the real world? Like, do you have all the items you would normally have in the real world? You know, if you use a consumable in the mindscape, is it used in real life? Or do you have different items? And might those items change? You can definitely do a lot of interesting things with like, you know, needing to collect certain things or like you're carrying a metaphysical version of this, of this object. And so you have things that are related to some of your permanent items but maybe you don't have like your full suit of consumables but you have like weird other things that are coming up that's right and you might be able to transform or change things things can be a lot more mutable in the mindscape where you're like ah oh, yeah you know maybe you're gonna use some skill checks to change your sword into a fire sword or like some kind of like a giant gravity gravity whip or like a boomerang or something because you're able to perform these alterations right so it could be that you're going to the mindscape specifically to give specific characterization of a character for mm -hmm. a particular plot point. But you could have a Psychonaut style campaign where you're just going to everybody's mindscape mm -hmm. all the time. If you want to do that, you could consider using the Into the Dungeon rules from the Battle Zoo Ancestry's Dungeon Ancestry for a Psyche Dungeon. Which are dungeons that are usually based on somebody's psyche. In this case, rather than like some mysterious person who died in the dungeon or was became your avatar or whatever. It's just the person's psyche that you went into and everybody is a potential dungeon yes. that you can delve down. And in those cases, it suggests giving rewards like free archetype feats or um, soul seeds or relics that, that advance as you clear the dungeon floors or other benefits like that that become stronger the more floors that you clear as you reveal more and more about this person's psyche, their troubles, and some individual like um, challenges that they ultimately have to overcome to self-actualize on each floor of the of the Mindscape dungeon. So there's a great question here. How would you design Mindscape hazards? So um, because Mindscapes are less bound by the laws of physical reality, hazards can do things that are more extreme and dramatic. Usually they're going to have very extreme sensory manifestations looking completely over the top or feeling completely over the top um because you know the the same kind of thing that in the real world be like oh yeah you know this explosion would have like created a giant crater that we then would have had to deal with and this kind of thing the mindscape can can alter and change right. um you could have a stampede of dinosaurs yeah. Just suddenly. And in the real world, you'd have to be like, where did they come, come from? from? Where yeah. did they go? Where did they come from, Cotton Eye Joe? But yeah. in, in your in your mindscape, it doesn't matter because it's a mindscape. And the dinosaur stampede could represent like the raging thoughts that, that are went out of control of someone who has just sudden bursts of inspiration mm -hmm. and they lose attention from what they were currently focused on. And it rages forward as all these dinosaurs. And maybe because the dinosaurs are actually straight out of control, creative thoughts... You could actually use like crafting mm -hmm. um, or some other skill like that or a lore skill um, to like engage that creativity in a certain way. And then the dinosaurs kind of get smaller um, or possibly like less wild, even though you would have thought it was going to be nature because it looks yeah. like dinosaurs. So in a mindscape when you're using hazards, hazards could generally have the same like negative effects when you get yeah. hit by them that you would find anywhere they would have possibly weird surreal visuals and most importantly is that because a mindscape may be a metaphor the disable the way you disable them with skills might be very different than what you think it would be on the surface and that might be a cause for uh for like needing sense motive or some other skill uh you use a perception of sense motive or a lore check or some other skill check to figure out what does this really mean first. Yeah. If you do that, make sure the hazard is balanced around the fact that sort of like 
figuring out what it does is part of disabling it. So if you would have said it takes four checks to disable this complex hazard, maybe it takes three and then one to figure out what it is first because people aren't going to guess. You yeah. need crafting or like a creative or like art lore on the dinosaurs. Even if you, if you say for a while that they're all different colors and, and that's not enough. Mm -hmm. So And in the same way that, you know, you can have an effect like a dinosaur stampede that you couldn't have in the, the physical world necessarily. You can also well, you have hazards. Could, you could, but, but like coming out of completely nowhere. Um, the hazards can also be more mutable on their routines where they, they change around over time or like they have more dramatic changes as you continue to disable them. They also might be... Uh, they also might be more likely to be mobile or wandering, just like thoughts can wander around or to, you know, adapt and mutate over time no matter what. Uh, yep. When you think about, like, how their resets are going to work, um, that's also going to be related to what they are. You know, hazard like with the dinosaurs, yeah. maybe you can disable it by channeling it into art and crafts. But if you don't, then maybe it actually, like, reaches over a peak and crashes and then suddenly everything turns black and dark and there's a giant pit and you fall down and they get depressed because they crashed out of it if you let it go to its natural ending and that's dinosaurs turning into a pit of darkness is definitely not even if you did have a dinosaur stampede it would not turn into a pit of darkness outside of a mindscape mm -hmm. or something like that and then also like you know if you have a hazard that's sort of of the more flighty nature of just like a stray thought that you know yeah like you were saying maybe that's going to go over and change into something else if you don't disable it whereas a hazard that like represents being like sort of cyclically stuck or something like that might be something that takes a while to disable or like there's you know a surface level way to disable it to kind of get around it but then it's harder to get rid of it in the get rid of it entirely so that like the first mm -hmm. time you deal with it it's more like okay let's disable it then later on it's like okay let's circumvent it and then eventually you figure out a way to to get rid of it for good. You might find that dealing with what the hazard looks to be only ever gives you the surface level, whereas discovering the metaphor of what the hazard really stands for lets you actually disable it. Yeah. So, for instance, maybe nature actually does work on the dinosaurs because they look like dinosaurs, and that's how the mind logic works, but it doesn't really help, and they do still turn into a pit of darkness if you didn't use crafting or art lore, which you might not have thought to use at mm -hmm. first. Or maybe, you know it resets fairly quickly if you use if you use nature and like wait no and then you, there's some clues to like okay that wasn't the way to fully to fully get rid of that exactly hazard. yeah so things are not always what they seem in a mindscape so you can decide whether engaging in them as if they are what they seem just works sometimes it's, that's the weird logic of the mindscape the what the dreamish logic or if it sort of works but you kind of need to figure it out or if it just doesn't work at all and you need to engage with the metaphor and not the surface level and that's true for hazards that's true for encounters you could have creatures with weird catches like a kind of the creature that represents a, a shared mindscape of a lot of people that's come into the physical world is a brainchild it's an mm -hmm. illusory creature based on the shared belief that it exists and has certain abilities and as long as people keep believing in it, it won't truly die. And you can have things that are like that in a mindscape very easily. That's mm -hmm. what like kind of many creatures in a mindscape might have weird yeah. abilities like and that. And you can have things where, you know, things that also reminds me of like, you know, the demon sin weaknesses where it's like you do this particular thing, then that's going to damage them. Absolutely having those kinds of things or having like weird ways to use skill checks in combat that wouldn't normally work to like, you can't normally like deal damage directly with intimidation but maybe here you can right or you could have like a representation of a kind of uh sort of uh that, that like alternates between different mental states mm -hmm. so you have like maybe a creature that um i'm thinking of like in omori where you can have different mental states on your character that change your like speed and defense and attack speed so like you can have a oh, creature yeah. that is like it's sad mm -hmm. and like it's gray out and it doesn't have all of its colors but maybe like it's its defenses are high when it's sad but it's its offense is lower but like you could cheer it up and then that will lower its defenses when it's cheered up. But yeah, it may, but raise it may offense, raise its yeah. offense because it believes in itself more. And then it might eventually become, um, if you cheer it up too much, it might become like really, really manic. Mm -hmm. And then it has really low defense instead of like normal amount and even really higher high offense. offense yeah. Almost like being in a rage. 
Mm -hmm. And so, like, it can change based on maybe either you intentionally using skill checks to do that or certain things that trigger in the environment or the combat that it likes or dislikes that move yeah. its meter on that. And it changes, may have special abilities that it can only use when it's in the, like, this sort of enraged, super, super manic, the, like, kind of more neutral, happy, mm -hmm. and then the, like, the sad state. Yeah. And one thing, one thing to be careful of when you're doing Mindscape type things is that because this very much gets into the internal world and often you're going to be in internal worlds of people who are struggling in some way is to, uh, to consider, you know, just as you are dealing with, you're dealing with metaphors for a lot of things, right? Um, being careful that you're, you're being sensitive about any things that are connected to like real world mental struggles. Well, you're going to want to ask well. your, yeah, even ask, if, yeah, even if you are literally a psychiatrist and you're certain yeah. that you're being sensitive about it, you're going to want to ask your group because mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, you might have someone in your group who struggles with this and is like, hell no, mm -hmm. not in the game. I struggle with this too much in real life, but you also might have someone in your group who's like, thank you. Yes, I would like to punch I that. struggle with this in my mm -hmm. life. And I can't punch it. So in this game, if I can punch it, that's going to empower me so much. And you will not know. Even if you know because the, the person has told you that they do or they don't have that condition, you will not know which of those which of feelings those, yes. they have if you do not ask. So this is the kind of thing that you want to talk to your group before you uh, sort of like suddenly throw it in, in a mindscape at mm -hmm. them. Because it could be, like, one of their favorite sessions ever for the right person. Um, it's, like, this, like, literally made my life better for mm -hmm. someone. Or it could be something like this literally was actively hugely negative for yeah. me. So you would do need to check. Mm -hmm. As Numbat says, communication. What a concept. Yeah, communication is always key. That's why things like pre-session, session zero. This may be, like, in the middle of your campaign. In the middle so of your campaign, really but you're like, zero. hey, you know this how does this this kind of thing work yeah figure it out by talking and make sure you understand the social contract of your group and you can find that mindscape sessions maybe some of your most popular sessions that you run you yeah another yeah and as you were mentioning like sort of like dungeon pcs and stuff like that going into the mindscape of one of the pcs can be a really cool way to explore things that are going on and have the player reveal certain things then that they want to ha reveal about their character imagine this all you tired gms out there you're running the main campaign but you don't always have the next thing ready or whatever so you you create a mechanic to um gain special powers by going on side quests of exploring the inner world of each pc which will unlock like super inner potential that you have. Not only will all the characters gain something, but that PC especially will unlock something really powerful. And the, but, but the key to it is the player of that PC runs the session when you're inside of them because they're going to reveal something about their backstory in that dungeon. You don't run it, maybe. Mm -hmm. And because... It is a, a mindscape is a self-contained world. It's kind of like we talk about in our episode about things with multiple GMs. It's, you're not gonna, you're not gonna step on each other's toes. And if something, if a character is represented differently in a mindscape than they are in the real world, well, that's, that's that person's, that's that person's perspective or image of them. It was run by the player of yeah. that PC. So if, if a certain character is villainous, mm -hmm. who is like the one that that player always says is a villain. Yeah. Even though you didn't intend them to be a villain, and they haven't acted villainous to anyone, but that one person's like, no, this first patron of Azar is secretly a villain, and they are a villain in their like inner dungeon, then that is perfectly reasonable because that's their mindscape. So they, they their character does think that it's a villain. So. Yeah, and it can be funny to play with the way that characters' beliefs differ from like what the players commonly understand to be the truth of the campaign. If you have a character who's like convinced that with characters behind a conspiracy or that like you know everybody's everybody's doing this or like you know the, the key to the the key to the world is you know you can never have enough swords and then like swords are the most important thing in there and then sort of dealing with that that juxtaposition where that character's uh perceptions or philosophy are are what is true like you know you you know out of care everyone knows out of character okay yeah you know that yeah, that character definitely rolled a natural one on that recall knowledge check, and that's why they think this. But in their internal world, 
Mm -hmm. And you'll find so many video games, movies, TV shows. We've named a bunch mm -hmm. from Persona to Inside Out, like already through this episode that will help inspire you for running a Mindscape kind of campaign, each of which is drastically different than the others about how they handle the the dangers of the mindscape, the topography of the mindscape, what sort of encounters you'll find there. But all of them share the fact that there's going to be metaphors and there's going to be things that you encounter that represent something else in a way that you basically can't easily do without being super ham-handed in like the physical world of your campaign. Yeah. And player and the kinds of things the players would be like, okay, yeah, you know, this breaks immersion that that this is happening this much on the nose in a campaign that's usually more serious. You can you can get to play around with that more in the mindscape, and the mindscape can also be a great place to have a have a switch in tone. You know, if the characters, if if they're a particularly like cheerful character whose mind you're in, who's in a more grim dark setting, or you know, vice versa. That's right. And so it allows you to play with causality as well in a way that um, you don't have to worry about people. Well, that's a stretch that this would happen because mm -hmm. it's in a mindscape. And that's just how those neurons fired for that person. And they considered that the cause and effect happened in that particular way. Yeah. And if the person whose mindscape that, you know, people are traveling through, if they have some kind of a consciousness that is aware of the fact that people within there, there's a good chance that they're going to choose to transform things at some point, you know, whether they're because they're like, ah, you know, don't go over there or like, what are you doing? Or if they're like, oh, don't let think me think about the pink elephant. Yes. Or like, let me try to help you get to this thing. And then it's like, oh, I know they're trying to help, but that's not helping. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So there's all sorts of that could even be a type of hazard or creature or any other kind of encounter. You could also consider there being um, all sorts of... I talked about victory point subsystems for just doing things in the mindscape or like, you know, like activate this area by cheering them up by mm -hmm. gaining cheerfulness points or um, help them garden their garden of memories to, uh, to like re-sprout some old memories that have been fading away. But you can also have a mechanic where the mindscape is something else. Like it's a, maybe it's an infiltration. Mm -hmm. because this is a, the villain's mindscape and you're trying to learn their secrets by yes. using a secret ritual. And what are our awareness points, which are a standard infiltration technique you can see in our infiltrations episode? Well, those represent the villain's mind subconsciously or consciously realizing that, no, these aren't just Someone's like... Poking around these aren't just figments of my imagination of my nemesis. Yeah. They're actually in my head trying to steal my secrets. So instead of doing like, you know, a mind reading type spell, it's like, oh yeah, we're going to do like this ritual and then it has yeah. sort of like this. this and as the awareness benefit, points yeah. go up, the villain starts imagining more and more dangerous things into their own mm -hmm. head to try to get rid and of these And if it goes pests. far enough, they're going to figure out, it's going to figure out exactly who you are. And what you're doing and yes. maybe project themselves in into there. Into your mindscape. Into, into then, their own yeah. mindscape to kick you out um, directly mm -hmm. by a, a direct confrontation. Yeah, you can also have, uh, instead of like an individual mindscape, kind of like a, a collective mindscape, a shared, a shared interpretation. You might see these being referred to more as like dreamscapes or like dream realms or things or like, like a that. Zeitgeist or a zeitgeist of, a, yeah. of like an entire like city or settlement that you like kind of tap into. And if you do that, then it can represent sort of the idea of urban legends or overall beliefs of what is true or not true that can really tell you more about a community or group. Mm -hmm. And it can also represent, you know, sort of mass challenges uh, or like, you know, widely, widely held beliefs, widely held difficulties, like large scale events that impacted a lot of people. Right. And so it helps you understand a little bit more about what the the normal average folk who are in that area believe when you start seeing things through their lens in a shared mm -hmm. collective mindset. Sort of like, you know, some kind of like a turbo haunt. Like a haunt might tell you a little bit of the story of things like that. But like the the psychic energy here is so powerful that you just get pulled into like the memory of of what's going on here and into like that collective experience. You also have creatures like the Zygo mind from PF1 that will just take thousands of people into a shared mindscape where everything seems to be fine, but the Zygo mind is just devouring them slowly over time. Mm -hmm. 
And then if you have, you know, people and consciousnesses inside of a mindscape, are they are they aware that they're inside of a mindscape or are they a part of you the person? Know you're in the matrix. Yes, exactly. You know, if you if they become aware of that, like, how do they feel about that? Or like, can you convince them that's like, yeah, yeah, you're trapped in here. This isn't really what you you think. You're like in this. Right. You're in this memory. Like, like the Zygo yeah. mind usually sends. It's first thing for a new mindscape for people is like them winning the fight against the Zygo mind and going back and being heralded as heroes and they get all their wildest dreams while really just this fungus is eating them yeah and then that 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 very classic story trope of like everything is wonderful what do you mean this is just an illusion no it's not no it's not we beat the cycle mine we're the heroes of the nation everybody likes us yes you did not beat the cycle mind the cycle mind, mind eats you. you yes indeed mm-hmm so there's all sorts of things you can do with like creepy, dangerous mindscapes being trapped in a mindscape accidentally. We talked mostly for this episode about intentionally going in there or the GM using it as a way for characterization, but it can definitely be a creepy, nightmare fuel type of activity, which again, you should talk to your players before doing yeah. it because they could wind up um, feeling certain amounts of trauma based on things that have happened to them in real life mm -hmm. if you wind up trapping them in some kind of traumatic mindscape as part of a, yeah. like, a monster's attack or assault on them. Sort of like the, you know, the false awakening recurrent nightmare where it's like yes. the character's goal is to escape the mindscape and get back to the real world and they know that they're not, they know that they're not conscious but they're trying to get out of it and they keep thinking like, wait, no, oh, we're out, no, we're not. <laughs> Yep. And it's the layers of how do you know what's real? You don't. <laughs> something, something, dreams of brains and jars. Something, something. <laughs> Maybe that's all anything is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, do we have any other questions from chat? I've looked on in chat and I saw the one about the hazards, but I haven't seen any other questions here. We talked about encounters victory point systems hazards creatures um like social events that you can wind up having even infiltration into a villain's mindscape so those are some of the main things that i wanted to talk about with mindscapes mm -hmm. so if that's it for everyone else too let's say goodbye to youtube do our outro yes bye YouTube. bye youtube see you on saturday or anytime because you're youtube <laughs>